It's uh, good to be with you again, and we're going to follow up uh, from the. Per, uh, we're going to continue through Matthew, chapter twenty-one, which begins with the entry of Jesus into Palm Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And um, last Sunday we looked at the question of uh, the the the, um, the enemies of Jesus asking him by what authority that he does these things because they're trying to put him into a. Um, there, well, it's going to, that anticipates the question of the high priest of whether Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, uh, which of course is the crowning point of the gospel. This is just an, an anticipatory of that. And now, uh, in these, the parable that follows, he takes the lead in questioning them. This is going to be the condemnation of the Jewish people. Um, I put this gospel, and those of you who, know, who, know, who have heard me or read some of the stuff that I've done, I, we, I put this gospel obviously before the year 70, the destruction of Jerusalem, and I would put it even earlier before the Council of Jerusalem, so at the year, at the year, in the year before the year 49, and so uh, at this time, there is uh, a commerce between the Jewish community and the, and the Christian community, and things are now coming to a head. So we'll read beginning in Matthew 21, verse 33. This is what Jesus said. Here is another parable. There was a householder who planted a vineyard and sent a hedge around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to tenants, and went into another country. When the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same. Afterward he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said, Have you never read in the scriptures the very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruits of, of it. When the chief priest, or I would say the high priests, and the Pharisees heard this, his parables. He perceived that he was speaking about them. But when they had tried to arrest him, they feared the multitude because they held him to be a prophet. I'm going to begin in verse 45 at the end for this reason, <laughs> because it is a discourse of how preaching should be. And that is quite customary for the pastor, the preacher, to use the word you in a sermon, especially in preaching the law and in the distribution of the Holy Communion to make a point that the body of Christ is given for you. Now that's fine, but really the best type of preaching is when the, the pastor is speaking about one thing without anything specific and somehow the people uh, get the uh, get the idea that they're the ones who are targeted in the sermon. Many years ago, if you don't mind sharing this um, personal episode, after I had preached in chapel, a colleague came up to me and said, <coughs> Dave, I was wondering if you were preaching against me or about me. And I said, I don't know, but I'll keep the option open. Well, the idea is that's the perfect preach. That's, that, is, that is preaching at its very, very best. So that the, uh, 
so that those who hear the sermon are drawn into the sermon. Now, when you go back and you look how this thing proceeds, beginning at uh, verse 33, it speaks about, uh, do we have 33 in the Greek up there? Thank you. I'm not, I'm not completely conversing. How to, you have a man who is an oika despotes. Uh, he's the master of a house. Uh, it's better than a householder. This is the guy who is in charge of everything. And he ingrains fe two sen. It almost looks like he engrafts a vineyard and he places a wall around it, he builds a wall, and he lets it out to, to farmers. Now, <clears throat> this might not seem obvious, but it really is. And that is, uh, this, can, I don't, this, this certainly can be included in the sermon. What is going through the mind of, the, of Jesus at this time is the uh, invasion of the Holy Land by the Jewish people. It's called uh, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of, of many vineyards. And uh, he planted a vineyard. And there's a reference here. To, this is really the closest thing that we get to the paradise of Genesis 3 is a vineyard. Um, if you're like us, we, we watch Rick Steves and... Uh, why there's hardly a country in, in Europe. Greece, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, that has vineyards. And what makes the world go around, what makes life possible is the fruit of the vineyard, namely a wine. And uh, wine creates a, a different state of consciousness, a happy state. So what is, in, what is in view here is really paradise. Now, what God intends to do in the Old Testament, and the people are quite willing to follow, <coughs> is a recreation of Eden, the place where everybody is happy. And um, here, but there's also here the doctrine of man and of how God looks upon the world, the doctrine of creation. God sets up the, God creates the world and he does not rule it directly. He rules it through Adam. He's the one who is told to, to uh, handle the garden, and to till the earth, and to take care of it. So here's a picture. What we have here in this parable from the very, it really is everything from Genesis chapter 2 and 3 down to the, end, uh, down to the death of Jesus. Everything, we have, we have this parable is is an illustration of the entire Old Testament of what God, of what God is doing. And, uh, and then you have certain epics in here. I don't know if it's necessary to say that anything is in mind here. But the, the prophets are sent to hold the people accountable and uh, to, to get the, to get the, whatever the, the whatever the, the vineyard produces, that, that belongs to God. And uh, you know the story of the Old Testament that everything doesn't. The people are very reluctant to give God his due. And the final sense, in the final stage, the, uh, the sun is sent. There's something here that is very much like the, um, like the Te Deum, the reference to his servants, the prophets. And in the economy of God, it is the prophets that have the highest level. Because they do not, they do not experience, they do not see directly. They do not see the incarnation. But they still believe and they carry out the will of God. And, and so in the ranking of heaven, they come first. And then he sent his son. It almost looks like Paul knew this passage or the writer of Matthew knew the passage, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. 
there was a certain plan that God had. And um, they took him in verse, they took him in verse 39 and cast him out of the, out of the vineyard and they, and they killed him. Now, I don't know if you want to quote the passage, on a hill far away stood a full, uh, a far, uh, an old rugged cross. But the, uh, Jesus is not put to death in the holy city. He is put to death outside of the city. And so this is a description of what is going, of what is going to happen. You know, there is good reason for some critics. Generally, they date the Gospel of Matthew very late. Um, the typical well, the, the typical view is that Matthew was written around the year 100 because it is so precise in picturing the death of Jesus. Um, because it says here in verse for, for, uh, it speaks, the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem is so precise because it says in verse 41 that he will put these people and he will put his mis uh, these people to a miserable death. Now, it's difficult to take um, to take a particular incident in history and draw a theological conclusion from it. I mean, nations have been uh, fighting against one another. One nation wins, another nation loses, and you conclude that the nation that loses was under the wrath of God, and therefore God is carrying out his vengeance upon them. Well, I don't know if that's a good idea to do. I'm not so sure that we preachers are capable of reading history in a theological way. But here is an example, or at least one example, where, uh, where God does. Now, the, uh, the, the reader of the Gospel of Matthew has already anticipated, that has, at least has been warned that this is, has, is, is, is given the position anticipating the destruction of Jerusalem. Because in the Babylonian, in the uh, genealogy, it speaks about their 14 generations from Abraham to David and from David to the captivity of Babylon and from the captivity of Babylon to Jesus, who was called the Christ, there are 14 generations. Babylon is mentioned four times in the introductory genealogy of the gospel. That is a sign of God's judgment against his own people. And now this judgment is being carried out. And, um, And uh, it's, it's, being, it's being carried out. And just a couple of points on this, on this thing here. It, it, it isn't that the kingdom is destroyed. The, the, the thrust here is that the kingdom is not destroyed, but there will be other people in it. Now, this is the point where, which I think can be made prominently in a sermon. There will always be a church. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. But it may not be, the, the people in the church not, may not be the people or the, that we know. And it may not be the, the, the children or the grandchildren of the people we know. And uh, last week I made reference that um, the United States is no longer a white, the, the white Christians are not the majority in the United States anymore. And this, uh, and th this is something that, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a family in the Missouri Synod that is, is not, a, is not, this does not pertain to. Uh, so for, uh, it is very, the idea that when that grandparents will get, get their children and their grandchildren to church, that era is past. These, uh, uh, the people who have left the church are already grandparents and they are not interested in bringing their children to church. And we have to just, this is, and we just have to face this. 
that God's judgment is being carried out in our time. That the church doesn't belong to one particular people, not one ethnic or racial group. That's not the way it works. Because it says here, it will be let out to a nation, uh, to a people that will do the good works. I mentioned last time, I think we have to mention that Lutheranism is no longer a vibrant force in the Northern European countries where it was conceived and where it, where it prevailed for many centuries. We're in a little better shape in the United States, but not much. The time is going to be coming. This is a warning that God will take the church away. Now to uh, dis uh, now to discuss a favorite hymn of many of our members. On a hill far away stood our old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It's a very dear hymn, and our people like it. And pictures of the crucifixion uh, show it, uh, its standard that the crucifixion took place on a hill. Here we have something else. It's doubtful whether it was carried on a hill. It was carried out in a garbage dump, the place where people got rid of all bad things, trash and everything else. And it was also done in a public place because the um, Romans used crucifixion as a deterrent for rebellion. They typically, when they went into, when they conquered a town, they, they at random chose two or three people and crucified them, not because they had committed any crime, but as a warning that they are not to rebel against the Roman government. And I mention this because you have this unusual passage here. The stone, the very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And this was <coughs> the Lord's doing. Now, you know the hymn, Christ is our cornerstone. You know the Bible passage. The church is built upon the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Well, you know, of course, that should really be the word keystone. Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State because it is, they took that name for themselves because in an arch, it's the state that joins the North, New York and New England to the South. Maryland, Virginia, and Carolina. It's a state which is in between. It's the, the rather than saying it's the cornerstone, it's the stone in the top of the arch. I'm always amazed in looking at an arch that the whole thing that holds it together is a small stone in the top. That is the that's the, that's, that's, that's the term that should be called cornerstone. If you should, and, the, that's, and the Romans, when they built their aqueducts and all of their buildings, that's how they built. They built these arches. Now, historically, the, uh, the claim is that the Romans invented the arch. Well, I think that's contested. That's neither here nor there. Maybe the Greeks already had it, but that one stone keeps the thing together. Now, the reference here, by the way, is to the temple. Even though that doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem to be, fits right in with the, the immediate context, that's exactly what this is. It's a reference to how, <coughs> of how the temple is built. And the place where Jesus was crucified was a quarry. The quarry is used in certain places where there are quarries. Qu quarries, when they have outlived their purpose, they become good swimming holes. They're also the place where people dump, dump their garbage and the junk. They be actually become garbage dumps because they're limitless. I think I've, 
I guess I've sometime in my life I've gone swimming in a quarry, I don't remember. But it would be ideal. It's down below. Jesus is crucified in a quarry that served as a, had two purposes. The purpose then was a garbage dump. The crucifixion was not a pleasant thing. Many of our people feel very uncomfortable looking at the crucified Jesus. Or even talking about crucifixion, it's like speaking about abortion. They don't want to hear and they don't want to face it. Crucifixion is an absolutely hard form of death. That before you die, the birds are eating away your flesh. And if the cross is low enough, they're doing it. This is a hard part of death. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't crucify on a hill to make it glorious and so forth. The point was it was absolutely the worst type of situation. And here comes the, the, here, here comes the beautiful point. Here Jesus, uh, Jesus the, the, reference is from the, the reference is from the Old Testament, from the Psalms. And that is in working, taking the stones out of the quarry, they left the most ignominious, the most insignificant stone there because it had absolutely no value at all. It wasn't fit for the temple of God. But yet that stone is Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who holds the whole church together. Christ is our cornerstone. Or in the English hymn, Christ the sure foundation. Everything hangs together by him. You know, when the evangelists were writing the gospel, they knew something. They were theologians. They were accomplished literary writers. They had, a hunt, they had things going around there in their mind, absolutely. So they look, well, look how this thing starts. It starts out with a vineyard. A vineyard is the exact opposite of the, of, of the world outside of the Garden of Eden. Vineyard produces wine. And wine makes, gives us a bit of joy in this miserable world. There is some kind of truth to thank God it's Friday. Because then you can take a drink and... You don't have to get up the next morning. That's the way, that's the way Noah built, a, uh, as soon as he got off the, the ship, he built a vineyard. And, and I guess he didn't, uh, the world had changed from the time he got on the boat. When he got off the boat, fermentation had, fermentation had set in place. And the poor guy got inebriated. That's a tale in itself. And we are now getting ready by speaking of the, of the vineyard is the kingdom of God. It becomes the church. We are the ones to whom God has given the kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, if you're a Christian, uh, you can't become a, a citizen of the state of Israel. And that's understandable. Because we understand ourselves to be the true Israel. We are the ones who are in the vineyard. And that vineyard becomes manifest every Sunday in which we celebrate the Holy Communion. We are, we are, we become the workers in the vineyard. And uh, then he, sw then, then Jesus switches over to this uh, business of the corner of this, uh, of the building. Now, yeah, now this this watchtower, which is built in the in the midst of it, is this symbolical of the temple? Well, could very well be, because in that temple, Christ Himself holds the temple together. He is the cornerstone, and uh, built on a rock, the church does stand. You know that hymn by Grunvig, Danish hymn. We are Christ, we are Christ, Christ's living stones in the temple. So that there is really enough here for you to work for, for a sermon. Um, the language is absolutely beautiful. The farmers are called, Georg, the, 
If you look in verse, uh, the name of the word appears several times in verse 33, gay or guys. That is our, it's, uh, the, the name George comes from that. George means a person who works in the earth. Take a look at that in verse 33. Get gois, a worker in the earth. And uh, if you're in an agricultural uh, community, you might want to make a point of that because people who really work in the earth, even farmers are, are not working in the earth, but that is a, that really are two preoccupations, workers in the earth and people who preach the gospel. And it certainly describes Adam. It says in verse 34, it says the time of the fruits of the harvest had come near and he sent servants to the farmers to take the fruits. There is something, by the way, of the office of the ministry. It's God who sends the prophets. It's God. It's, um, it's God who authorizes the prophets and the preachers, not the people. And here are the various forms of death which they did. They stoned him. They, did, uh, they killed him. And uh, they did it. If you read the Old Testament, by the way, the prophets weren't very popular. Anyone who enters the ministry has to realize that. The ministry is not intended where about to, be, to be popular, that the person who's the minister is going to be popular. In fact, if he's too popular, he's not probably preaching anything that really that corresponds to the Word of God. And uh, so, so the pastor, the prophets in their suffering, if you read through the Old Testament, there was Moses, and Isaiah and Jeremiah, the, the people didn't believe what they had to say. And even uh, St. Paul, our ever popular St. Paul, he gets to the end of the book of Romans. I mean, he gets to the end of the book of Acts and he realizes nobody has b believed what he, had, what he had to say. That simply comes from the antagonism of the world to the church and to the message of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, yeah, there's a lot to work here, and you don't have to preach at all. I like the concept of the vineyard, because the, the concept of the vineyard means it's paradise. And for a lot of people, a beer or a, a little alcohol on the last day of the week is a paradise. It's temporary, but it's a paradise. And, it's anticip and the Holy Communion is anticipatory of the final paradise where we will all be. <coughs> Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure being with you.